Many people suffer from low self-esteem. All right? When you think about yourself, you always put yourself down. You, you, you feel unworthy. You, you feel that you do not measure up to other people. So you have, when people talk about, uh, you know, things about, you, you just feel like, I don't fit in. All right? I'm not worthy to talk about such things. I don't feel like I am good enough. And of course, many people think very pessimistic. And this is due to certain things which happen in their life, all right? So we talked about depression last week, and I say it's a very real problem, all right? It cuts across races. It's not specific to any race. It's not specific to any uh, age. It's not specific to a certain uh, country. It is through the whole world, cuts across everybody's uh, you know, age, race, gender. It doesn't matter. All right? It doesn't matter whether you are here in the States, whether you are in a country like Singapore, where I grew up. You know, it doesn't matter. It's everywhere. All right? And this is because of certain things which have happened in their lives, in your lives. All right? And one of the things which people suffer from is abuse. All right? Many people, having grown up when they were a child, they were abused physically, sexually, mentally, and therefore they suffer from this abuse after they grow up, all right? And some people get into depression because of death in their family. So some loved one in their family, so could be a parent when the child was small, so it could be father, mother, it could be wife, husband, it could be the death of a child. So all people go through that and suddenly they feel so depressed because they do not know how to handle it. And then there are other people, many, many people, who suffer from rejection. When they grow up, they are rejected by other people. So they have these relationship problems. They are always alone. So they think nobody cares about me, nobody really loves me. So therefore, they get into a depressive state. All right? So it has to do with relationships with other people. They are not good at relationships. They're never good at relationships. So they feel like, you know, that's me. So how do I change this? All right? So I wrote down some of these things as well. And sometimes people, and because of the, uh, you know, the people whom you work with, uh, as many of you know, I was a university professor and I mix around with a lot of university professors, of course, but at the same time in my classes, um, because I taught at the uh, MBA level, so I met a lot of professionals. So they were all engineers, they were all uh, you know, high, highly educated people, and they all believed that their identity was tied to their jobs. So that means if they do not make a certain amount of money every month, they were considered failures. So they work very, very hard. They work from morning to night, and then at night they come to take MBA level classes because they need that money. So I've met people who lost their jobs, all right? They worked for IBM before. Uh, because we were in the Hudson Valley, that was the main production plant for IBM. So they lost their jobs. And when they lost their jobs, <laughs> they fall into a complete depression. They got divorced. They, everything happened in their life because their financial position, which gave them their security and their identity, was now gone. All right? And those were the people whom I interacted with. So imagine if you're making $100,000 and now suddenly you're making zero. You live in this nice house, taxes are sky high, which you know. And how are you going to pay the taxes? How are you going to pay the mortgage? How are you going to pay for that three cars in your garage? You know, so suddenly they get into this position and they say, well, what do I do now? And then, of course, there are other people. You're, you're, it's not about financial, it's not about relationship. It's about 
the fact that because of certain things which happen in your life, you know, you get into alcoholism. You say, well, nobody loves an alcoholic like me. I've drank for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I told you about the, the owner of the house whom I used to rent from back in Arizona. He was an alcoholic. Every month when we, the students who rent the house from him, would give him the rent, he would take that rent and he would buy uh, whiskey, all right? Johnny Walker whiskey in those big bottles. So he would buy a few of those bottles every time, every night. He would sit there in the living room on, because he, he has a part of the house and we students would be renting the other parts of the house, all right? So he would sit in his sofa and he would take that Johnny whiskey straight so he would have a cup, pour some into it and he would start drinking. So he would drink from about 8 o'clock at night until 6 o'clock tomorrow morning before he goes to sleep. And he would finish two or three bottles of that Johnny Walker whiskey. All right? And that's what he believed he is. He's an alcoholic. Nobody cares about him. He doesn't go outside. He doesn't do anything besides drinking. All right? And I swear to you, in, I stayed with him for one year. He must have drank a truckload of those whiskey. All right? And that's what an alcoholic does. All right? So people believe in that one. So, of course, there are some other people who have illnesses. You have a certain disease, and you say, Well, you know, God didn't heal me. You know, nothing happened in my life. You know, I don't even believe in God. But look, you know, I have this problem. So they fall into deep depression. They say, Well, that's the end. I cannot get out of this. You know, people have bipolarness, people have, uh, you know, all types of sicknesses and they say there's no help for me no support nobody is supporting me so you go into depression all right and then of course there are other people you know younger people they get pregnant they say what am i supposed to do now or some people who really want kids they have they get pregnant and they have a miscarriage they say oh no that's the end so you see, it's all, it's so, you can list down so many other things, which I didn't think about, which can cause depression in people, all right? Some people, marriages, fail marriages. Some people go through divorce. Some people, it, it, it is so emotional. It is so traumatic. People come back from wars. They suffer from PTSD. You know, all of these are very real things, all right? It's not something to be laughed at. It's not something that you say, oh, no, you don't have a problem. Yes, you do have a problem because of the circumstances in life, because of certain things which have happened to you, all right? Either as a child, as an adult, as growing up, young teenager to older person, all right? And sometimes if you're older, you feel like, hey, nobody cares. My kids are all gone. You feel completely alone. Nobody cares about you. All right? So you see, all of these things are real and puts people either into great stress, into anxiety, or into depression. All right? So how does the person feel after that? Once you get into that position, all right? so I wrote down some other things. Well, of course, you feel sad. Sadness, hopelessness, and the big one, worthlessness. All right? Who can love a person like me? Who can love an alcoholic? Who can love a drug addict? Who can do... I mean, you know, and, and you see, the problem is this. The, let us say, the alcoholic says to himself or herself, who can love me? I am unlovable, all right? Because I am not worthy to be loved. So how do you think that person who feels unworthy to be loved will behave? will behave in a manner that reflects how he or she is feeling, right? So I'm unlovable, so I'm going to react in an unlovable manner to everybody. And the moment people see how you react, they avoid you even more. Because it's a spiral going downwards, as I told somebody last week. It's not something that you can say, well, you know, I hope that everything will be better. Nothing will become better. 
So I told that person, you see, it's a spiral. You don't feel good about yourself. You say, nobody loves me. So you behave like nobody loves you. Then the moment people see that you behave that way, now nobody loves you even more. And then you see the results of that action and you say, look, it's true. Nobody loves me. So therefore, I'm going to behave even more antisocial. And then when people see that, people avoid you more and you get into a deep depression. And then one day, as I told you many times, once, you know, a message which I gave a long time ago, people consider suicide. And it has nothing to do with how much wealth you have or how poor you are. It has nothing to do with all of that, all right? You, you, I see a lot of this on the news, people, you know, very, very rich people, singers, rappers, you know, one just committed suicide just the other day, all right? Extremely rich people, they commit suicide because they go into this hopeless, depressive state and they say, well, I'm going to commit suicide, all right? So, and of course, Many people may not be at that stage. You may be at a better stage, but you still feel very irritable. You have lots of anxiety. So, little things which don't bother other people bother you a lot because of a certain state you are in. The other things is loss of interest, trouble thinking, trouble sleeping, Tiredness. You, you see, it's all related to having this anxiety and this depressive state you are in. And of course, the big one, weight loss, weight gain. All right? People think, oh, I'm not good looking, so I have to gain some weight. You know how some you, teenagers, you know, sometimes they say, well, you know, nobody loves me. Look. Because of the way I look. Woo, look at that one. So I want to gain weight to be like that person. You know, shape, not like this. And then there are others who look like this. And they say, no, 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 we want to be like that. So, so then you start to have this, all these eating disorders in order to get the way you think it should be. And then you get depressed. Because you see, there's only so much you can do before you say, well, you know, I cannot lose any more weight. You know, I've got to eat. Or you say, well, you know, I cannot, I, I cannot eat all this food. So it's all this stress out there for the younger people and for older people as well. And many times, in your depressive state, it gives you, it actually eventually leads to physical problems, all right? You will develop pains, uh, certain types of, eat, you know, digestive problems. You will, be, simply because the body is a whole lot of chemicals inside, all right? So the moment you generate a lot of, you know, these chemicals, certain parts of your body will be affected There's medically, all right? So we're talking medical now. So what do people do, you see? You see, when you feel that way, as I said, if you, if you feel that you are too heavy, you are too thin, you are too short, you are too tall, what do you do? So you, you see, because of you feel bad, so you tend to remove yourself from interacting with other people whom you think is normal. All right? So you start to withdraw. You, you, you use your phone a lot, you know, instead of calling, you text, because that's the new thing, right? You text them and so on. And then, of course, you know, you're on Facebook and Instagram and everything. And you, you, you see, Facebook is a great, you know, I, I've been on Facebook forever. But Facebook, you have to understand one thing. Facebook shows you the highlights in somebody's life. Let us say somebody is on vacation, all right? They are in Hawaii. So what do you think they share on Facebook? I'm in Hawaii, look at me. And you, being the friend of that person, what do you see on Facebook? Wow, that person is in Hawaii having the time of his life or her life. Look at that, look at that picture, wow. And then of course, they, were, they are eating lobster and everything, so of course they will take a picture. 
Yeah, my food I'm eating. And then you look at your hot dogs at home. And you say, What's, why, what am I doing, you know? I work so hard, I don't get to go to Hawaii. I have this hot dog here, which tastes awful. And look, they are having fun in the sun. They look good. Their hair is gorgeous, you know. They are, they are eating lobster. Yeah, you have burnt corn. How do you think you feel? Look, look, let's be real, you see. Let's talk real here. You don't feel so good. Not that you were bad before, but now you feel bad. Because you look at your friends having fun. And you are not having fun. You are working and eating hot dogs. And that's what happens. You see, it is a, it can become, Facebook can become a very depressive place to be. And when people are all done up nicely, they're going to the prom, they're going out somewhere, you know, for the evening, they're dressed really nice, they have three hours of makeup on their face, they take a selfie. And you look and you say, man, that friend of mine, she looks so good. And then you look at yourself, you say, man, you know, this is what I get after three children. I hate my husband, I hate my... And you see, you don't really hate your husband. You actually love your husband, you love your kids, but that's the way you feel, especially if you are going through a period. You, you, you are hating everybody. Look at that friend of yours on Facebook, looking like a million bucks and having the time of her life. You, you see, but that's not real, you see. But that's real to you. So you start to have stress, anxiety, and ultimately, you avoid people. You start to avoid more and more people. You cannot mix around with people anymore. You're not a normal person. Because the way you think you are, you are going to become that person. And of course, for all those people who, who have been abused, you know, you know, you went through tough times in your life, you feel the shame of it all, you know. You know, I've seen men, who, uh, I've talked to men, all right, not just women, men who were abused when they were young, and they're always ashamed of themselves. The shame of it all. You think that somebody else will find out Oh, what happened to me when I was young? What happened to me when I was a teenager? You know, I know, I read all the statistics. I told you I work in a university. Women get raped. Men, you know, I, you, you have to understand that that is the world. But the shame is very real. So once again, you feel unloved, rejected, and of course, as time goes on, you get into a depressed state. I mean, what can you do about it, you see? Because it's hopelessness, all right? It's nothing, you, you believe that nothing can be done. Nobody cares. Otherwise, they would already be around you. But nobody wants to be around you because nobody wants to be around a person who behaves in a depressive state. So that's the spiral. You see, you believe, you, you want people to give you that love, that acceptance. But nobody wants to give you that love and acceptance because they look at you and they say, why should I give you that love and acceptance? Because you are so unpleasant to be around. But you actually don't know that you are unpleasant because you are in a hurt state, so you don't know that you are doing it. But other people can see it very well. And, and, and the whole thing is this. You, you see, when you are in that state, how do you recover? So this is the usual thing, all right? To do something, you know, people say, well, why don't you do something, you know, and then people will appreciate you. 
And this is what children were taught. Okay? You took out the rubbish, the trash, when you were small, and your mother said to you, well done. Correct? Because you did something. You did something. You did something, and somebody else will be pleased with you. Therefore, the only way to earn, to earn love and acceptance and a congratulatory note is to do something. So you want and you seek this love and approval from other people by accomplishing something. So you always try to earn this love from other people. And how do you earn love? So you want to be richer, all right? If I make more money, people will love me. So that's why, you know, you have uh, people who are in the, you know, entertainment industry. You see, they, they grew up from broken homes. They said, you know, well, we have nothing. So if I make enough money, if I've become famous enough, if I own enough stuff, people will love me. And at 35 years old, they commit suicide and they die. Actors, actresses, world-famous personalities. Just this year alone, there are so many 2018 high-profile people who committed suicide. People who might watch on TV. I don't know whether you watch this show, you know, uh, uh, Laura and I, we, we like to watch cooking shows, and of course there was this chef, Anthony Bourdain. We watched him for many, many years before. And he was in France, and I think he committed suicide there. <laughs> Everybody was completely shocked. World-famous chef travels around the world, and you think that he had the greatest life. He couldn't take it anymore, committed suicide. Didn't show up for production next morning. People went to his room and he was dead. You see, because you think that the way to get out of depression is to try to earn somebody else's approval by having more things, being richer, all right, and to do more good things. For church people, you try to do things whereby you say, well, you know, if I am a better boy, if I'm a better girl, if I'm a better person, then surely the pastor will love me, you know, other people in the church will love me. And you see, that's the thinking which has very short-term benefits but doesn't heal anything. It will help you for a while. You do something. Remember last week I told you, yeah, people will say, okay, go bake a pie. Baking a pie is good therapy. But how long does it take to bake a pie? Yeah, and then of course eating it gives you pleasure for another while. Or makes you feel guilty actually after that. After you eat it, I mean, while you're eating it, it feels good. After you eat it, then you feel guilty for a week. So this is what people do in a depressive state. And you have no idea how to get out of it, all right? Okay, now, you go to church, okay? I'll, I'll, I'll share with you this from my heart, all right? You go to church that, because you are a believer in Christ, and let us say you are in a depressive state, and you go, and, and you say, I really need help, all right? And I'll show you exactly where the scripture is where people try to tell you to do this, all right? This is quite good, all right? So I want you to hear this. In, it's found in Philippians chapter 4, all right? Philippians chapter 4, starting from verse 6, all right? Here is something which many, many pastors have used to help people come out of worry, anxiety, stress, depression, all right? Let's read this. Be careful for nothing, all right? That means don't worry about anything. Don't worry. Everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. We have many requests, all right? 
We are in a depressive state. We need jobs. We need relationships. We need, a, you know, to change the way we see ourselves. So all of these things. So the Bible says this. Don't worry. So we, we think that is very good because, you know, Jesus talks a lot about being, not being worried, all right? So let, let's, let's unpack this for a while. First of all, what, Jesus, what the Bible says, that's definitely true. Why are you worried? How does it help you if you're worried? So let us say I worry about uh, not being tall enough. All right? Okay? So let us say you're a teenager, you want to play basketball, but you are only 5 feet 5. You look at your friends, they are 7 feet 5. So you worry that you are not tall enough. Now, does worrying, I mean, that is actually from the Bible, does worrying add one inch to your height? So I worry that I'm short. It doesn't help you in any aspect. It doesn't change anything, all right? And of course, you know, back in the, I think, one of the first few messages which I preached, you know, 20 years ago, you know, I, I used to say this, uh, human beings are the only people who worry. All right? Uh, animals don't worry. Have, have you ever seen, uh, you know, or birds, have you ever seen a bird on a branch suddenly fall over and die from worry? Have you ever seen uh, an animal, a deer, standing in the field die from anxiety? You, you see, it doesn't happen. No animals worry. They react, yes. But they don't worry. Because God made us higher. We have a big brain. And in that big brain, we worry. But God says, don't worry. Now, it's a very good advice. But many times, it's very hard to do it. Don't worry. What do you mean, don't worry? You see, it's good advice, but people worry. Everything by prayer. Okay, what is prayer? Prayer is talking to God, communicating with God, all right? And supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God verse 7, which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Okay, so now he's talking about the peace of God. Finally, brethren, here's another step, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, any virtue, any praise, think on these things. Think on these things, all right? So this is the advice you'll get in the church, all right? Number one, don't worry. You agree to it, okay? But you worry. And then the next step is when you pray, you know, and whatever you do in this life, just think about these things. Think about things which are true, lovely, honest, and if you try it, it really works. But the thing is, in your flesh, you are going to see things which are not true, which are not good for you, and you are going to live in this. When you look at the politics, when you look at life itself, when you talk to people, you are going to encounter a lot of things which are impure, a lot of things which are not honest, a lot of things which will pollute your mind. So to do this, all right, on a consistent level, 24 hours a day, I find to be unrealistic. I know this is the Bible, and if you can do it, that's great. You see, if the pastor tells you, don't worry. Okay, you lost your job, all right? 
you have been abused. And the pastor says, don't worry. You, you see, if you can do it, that's wonderful. But you cannot do it. Because you can not worry for a while, but at the end, when night comes and you are by yourself, you will worry. You will start to think of things which you are not supposed to think of. You can watch a movie and people say, oh no, you cannot watch movies. You, you see, suddenly, what is supposed to be good and helpful in the Bible starts to become another list for you to do and not do. But that's what got you in the first place, you see, because people told you, well, you have to do this, then people will like you. So you did it and nothing happened. And then you go to church as a believer in Christ, and then the pastor, the teacher, people gave you more things to do, more lists to do, all right? Because what they are trying to tell you, what everybody is trying to tell you, including yourself, is you are no good. If you do some of these things, then you will come on, be good. You will get to that position finally. You see, it's like how um, young people think, all right? I hate myself here. I hate, I hate this house. I hate this place. I hate my parents. I hate everything. If I can get to that city, I will be happy. Every young person has taught this. Everyone. The problem with my life is that I'm here in this place. If I get to that place, I will be happy. That's why I have to get away from my parents. That's why I have to get away from school. I want to get away from all my friends who are my enemies. You know, I mean, I, I hate all this here, but if I get over there, I will be happy. It doesn't work. Why? It doesn't work because when you get there, you are there. And you are your own unhappiness. So you will never be happy because that's where you will be. And because you are there, the unhappiness will start to build around. And so if you drink here, you will drink over there. You don't get to a new place and suddenly stop drinking, suddenly stop taking drugs, suddenly everything is fine. Nothing will change. It will change. The environment will change a little bit. Okay, new city, new place. Your mind is occupied for a while. But in fact, after a month or two, everything will be back to square one. The drinking, the depression, everything will be back. All right. So you go to a church, and this is what they tell you to do. Okay? So whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, praise, Think on these things, all right? So the people, the pastors will tell you, this is what you have to do, all right? So then people start to interpret this. They say, well, let me tell you what now to do, all right? You cannot watch any more movies, all right? Don't, don't watch TV anymore. If you watch all that killing and all that murder on, you know, on TV, you know, your mind gets all polluted and therefore that brings you depression. And you thought, man, you know, okay, now I give up TV. And they say, oh, okay, no, 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 you, if you watch dinosaurs eating people, well, that's it, finished for you, you know, because now you are involved in, you know, all that blood and all that stuff. Don't watch dinosaur movies. Okay, let's give up dinosaur movies. Okay, can we watch cartoons? But cartoons are very violent, you see, more violent than real life. All right, because you, I mean, you know, when you grow up with uh, Tom and Jerry, you know, I mean, Jerry gets beaten, uh, Tom, I mean, they all get beaten up completely. You ever seen the cat? You know, the, the, the tail gets smashed 10,000 times, you know, the head gets smashed in, you know, they get to be nothing and then they bounce up again and they get to be, I mean, it's completely violent. Okay, no more cartoons for you. Okay, then what else are you to watch? All right? And then you watch your, your parents fighting. Okay, never mind. Now we don't want any parents. You watch your brothers and sisters fighting. That's not pure. That's not honest. You watch lying people. Okay, let's, let's become a hermit. 
Let's move up the mountain, live in the forest. You, you, you see, somewhere along the way, you, you say, yeah, nature is violent, yeah, you know. You go there and you watch the bear eat the deer, and you say, oh no. You know, Bambi died a thousand deaths. You see, everything, you, you, you see, the, the solution people are giving to you is, you are no good, and you have to do something, whether it's a worldly way or a Christian way, so that you can become, in, go, get to that position, get to that place, and then you will have no more depression. You will have no more, you, you will not have that feelings anymore, you see. So everybody tries very hard. And many times it's good advice. But the problem is it doesn't last. You see, as I told you before, if you suffered in your life before, abuse, you know, low self-esteem in resulting from that, you know, death, financial loss, everything is okay for a while, all right? Nobody loves you, all that sort of things. Everything will be okay for a while until night comes when you are home alone, when you are in your room alone, when you're in your house alone. You know, there's many times in your life whereby you are alone. You can be married, you can be single, doesn't matter, all right? When you are by yourself, you are going to worry, you are going to think of things, you are going to get into depression because the circumstance will still be there. And you know, you, you will read further in Philippians 4 where it says, you know, um, verse 11, uh, I have learned in whatsoever state I am, to be content, all right? And, and it seems so good. It seems such, such great advice. Whatever state I am in, all right, I am content, as Paul says. Paul says, I'm not affected by all these things, you know. I am content. And you say, but how can I be that situation? Because you, you have no idea. You have no idea what my life is like. You know, real life is not like that. But this is the Bible's way of dealing with it. So there must be some secret there which we all have missed. We all thought that, oh yeah, look, uh, whatsoever state I am, there with, in that situation, in that circumstance, I am content. If you are having an abusive husband, a, you know, wife, you know, things, you, if you are suffering from cancer, some incurable disease, the doctor says, you're not very contented. Or at least you can pretend to be content and then go back home and not be content when nobody is watching you. I mean, I don't come around to your place and bother you, check on you, police on you. You see, it is real and it will be there. And people suffer greatly from this. Like I said, it comes out in physical pain. It comes out in migraine headaches. I used to have migraine headaches too when I was young. Low self-esteem. Many of these things which I describe here are my personal things. Probably yours as well. Some of you, very long list. Some of you, shorter list. But somewhere you will fall. So you're going to take it out by eating, not eating, the way you behave, the way you talk, the way you behave, yeah, everything, it will just come out. All because people, including the church, told you you are no good. And you have to do something to become better. So depression will be around. Doctors will make billions of dollars handing out medication. Because medication doesn't heal. Medication just calms you down. So now you are unable to function. You're unable to worry because of the medication. So every time you worry, you start popping pills. And the more pills you pop, because like I told you, the body is chemical, so now there is a chemical dependency on the drugs, and now you're caught. Can be drinking, can be anything. So you get caught in this because you're trying to heal something, but it doesn't heal. You can go make more money until you die, and it will 
never heal your problem. Because frankly speaking, all right, for all those people who have, you know, you have, uh, you, I told my wife, you know, because we learned this, you, you know, living in California, you watch all these uh, Hollywood stars, you, you see, nobody actually cares how much money you have. People really don't care about you very much. But you want people to care, so you make money, so you feel that you are a multi-millionaire, so you want people to care about you, but actually they don't. People don't care about you. You say, if I buy this car, that my neighbour will love me. Actually, your neighbour hates you even more. <laughs> or at the very best, he, does, he or she doesn't care about you at all. You see, you build huge houses because you want everybody to see who you are. People don't care about you at all. And you die in that house from misery and depression. All because you want people to love you and accept you. All right? Uh, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Let me show you. this very familiar scripture, all right? Acts 2, verses 1 to 4. Now, this, of course, is Pentecost, all right? When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Next verse. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Next verse. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, set upon each of them. And verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. All right? Now, let me address this problem. I, I, I've talked about this before, but now I want to link it back to how you feel. You see, the concept that you are no good worthless until you achieve something is a lie. When you put your belief in Jesus, you say, Jesus, I believe that you died. You paid the price for my sins. You paid the price for the whole world. The moment you put your faith in Jesus, that very instant, that very instant, your spirit, all right, and as well as your mind, because we, the Bible says you have now the mind of Christ, but of course your mind is influenced by your body. The very instant you put your faith in Jesus, you become completely perfect because of Christ in you. Christ, you die with Christ. And when you die with Christ, you are also resurrected with Him. So you are actually perfect, spiritually, as well as having the mind of Christ. Your body is not, but you are as the spirit, all right? And you are the spirit man. So, biblically speaking, you are perfect. And when you are perfect, because of Christ in you, the Holy Spirit now comes and dwells in you. I told you many times before, in all my preaching, the Holy Spirit doesn't come into a dead body. The Holy Spirit doesn't come into a rotting body. The Holy Spirit doesn't come into imperfect people. The Holy Spirit comes into you because Christ made you perfect. So all these people, disciples, all of them, they were waiting up there in one accord because they all believe in Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, look, you wait here, I'm going to send you the comforter. They were all in one accord in one place, in one accord. They were all in Christ together. And they were all perfect. But, but if you look at their lives, they were a mess. Some were very fearful. Some have been abused. Some have been tortured. You know, every, every, every type of person was up there. Fear, low self-esteem, people who didn't think they were very much, people who were persecuted. 
all up there together, and yet the Holy Spirit filled them. Why? Because in God's eyes, every one of those disciples up there were considered perfect. Every one of you here, yes, through all of those things which I mentioned, yet God sees you as perfect because of Jesus in you. And if you do not catch that revelation, you believe that you still have to do something to get there, then you are believing in a false gospel. Because if you have to do something in order to earn God's favour, in order to earn salvation, in order to earn that position as son and daughter, then you are believing in a false gospel. Somewhere you have been taught a lie. That is a gift from God. That's why it's called in the Bible a gift of righteousness. It was given to you free the moment you believe in Christ. So you see, let me explain this again. The moment you receive Jesus Christ, you already are there. You do not have to become what you already are. You are there already. You have to learn. You have to study. You have to change your mind, as the Bible says. Even though the mind of Christ was given to you, but your old mind, with all its old thinking, has to be trans changed, has to be transformed. But there is nothing that will change in you if you do not let the Holy Spirit and Jesus change you you will be exactly the same person as you were before, even though you are now a Christian. So you already are. You don't have to become. And people say, well, you know, now I have to go seek. I have to go find something, even though I'm a Christian, so that I will have something. You know, every gift of God was given to you at that instant, by the Holy Spirit. That instant. So you are always, you're thinking, I don't have enough. I, I have to do something, I have to get something. You know, there must be something I must do in order for me to get this. But you're already given it. You just don't know it. So it's not something that you do to get to that position, because you're already at that position. Many people say, you know, yeah, you know, um, yeah, my life sucks right now, but, you know, the best will come one day, you know, it's, I mean, it sucks, man, I mean, you know, everything is wrong about me. Actually, there's nothing wrong with you at all. Because the best is not around the corner. The best is in you, already. His name is Jesus. You are completely unaware of who you are. So you run around all the time, you know, with wrong thoughts. You see, I told you, abuse as a child, abuse as a teenager, rape, used by other people. How are you going to ever recover from that? Depressed your whole life. You, don't met, you see, because you think you have to do something in order to get out of this abuse. But you see, the restoration is already yours. At that moment, you believe in Jesus. It was already given to you. Now you have to unpack that gift. People say, well, uh, what about death? I told you death. Death destroys many people. People are so depressed because their son died, their daughter died, their parents died, their wives died, their husbands died. They say, well, you know, I, I woke up, my husband was dead. And they get into depression. And they say, my son, my husband, my wife, my daughter, my, you know, they pass away, they died. Once again, that was already soft. You see, they didn't pass away, they didn't die. They pass on into the land of the living, called heaven. 
They didn't pass away like, poof, okay, they're gone. Okay, now nothing. Oh, they died. The worms are eating my loved one. No. Death was solved and conquered by Jesus as well. You see, your loved one passed on into a better life. Heaven. You are the one not enjoying your life. They are enjoying their life with Christ. You say, what happens? You know, I have low self-esteem. Do you know who you are in Christ? Do you, priceless, do you know the price that God gave to you? You see, every message I preach, I relate it back to Christ. You see, because you are thinking, if I do something, then I become a better person. And God says, no, you are the best person you are right now because of Christ in you. And you have to acknowledge that. You see, the moment somebody acknowledges that, the moment somebody can say, it's not about me. It's about me resting in what Jesus, what you have done for me, and therefore all that goodness, all that worthiness, all that power, all everything which is Jesus now comes to me. The moment people can see that, the transformation starts. Because every other thing which I told you about just now comes from outside in. This is the only one which comes from inside out. And it's the only thing which will heal you completely, restore you, promote you, take you from nothing to everything. You can be the lowest self-esteem person, rejected your whole life, abused and shamed by people, and one day, if the, informa- if the transformation starts because of the Holy Spirit inside you, one day you will share with thousands of people and encourage all those people. Because it has nothing to do with improving yourself, with performance, with doing something, then people will love me and accept me. It has to do with the fact that you are unconditionally loved and accepted first by Jesus. And that is why now you can do everything else which comes as a son of God, as a daughter of God. You see, it's not about putting down people It's not about saying, oh, give me the five steps to doing this. The five steps are good. But when night comes, the sixth step will take over. Because the five steps don't work when you're by yourself in the dark. But when the transformation comes on the inside, when you know who you are, when you can honestly and sincerely say, like Paul says here, in whatever circumstances, whatever state I am, I am content. Because you know why. I read this again. Verse 8. Can you put verse 8 back again? Philippians 4, verse 8. So I read this again. And I said, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. And I say, well, but who is our truth? Jesus. Whatsoever things are honest, who is honest? Jesus. Whatsoever things are just, who is just? Jesus. Whatsoever things are pure, who is pure? Jesus. Whatsoever things are lovely, who is lovely? Jesus. Whatsoever things are of good report, who is our good report? Jesus. If there be any virtue, who is virtuous? Jesus. If there be any praise, praise you, Jesus. Think on Jesus. And then the last scripture, Isaiah 26, verse 3. I said, could this be true? Because it says, the peace of God which pass all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. That's verse 7. The peace of God, that's what we are talking about. Instead of depression, anxiety, worry. Look at Isaiah. This is the promise of God. You will keep him, any person, in perfect peace. 
how do you get this perfect peace? Is it by doing, by achieving, by doing more moral things? Whose mind is stayed on thee, you, because he trusted in you. The only way you will be fully restored out of depression, out of all this low self-esteem, self-hatred, is if your mind is stayed on Jesus. There is no other way. Just like sin, Romans chapter 6, very clear, the only way you are going to overcome sin is because of Jesus. Grace. Not by putting more law. You put more law, you do more things, you, your mind will get more messed up. To have perfect peace, your mind must stay in Jesus. And Jesus is rest. I told you from our Joshua discussion, you are all going down. Jesus came and intersected your life. Everything changes. But your mind must not turn to the left, must not turn to the right. You want perfect peace in this life to stay content? Your mind stay on Jesus. Every abuse He will remove and replace with peace. Every death He says that's life. Every low self-esteem, he builds you up. Every abuse, everything that you ever suffered. I talk about illnesses, diseases. God says, I already did solve that too. By my stripes, you are healed. You see, every problem, he already foresaw it before he created the world. And he gave the solution before the problem even came up. Sin problem? Adam? Who do you think existed before Adam? Jesus. Jesus already took care of that sin problem. Before Adam was created. Before the world was formed. Yes, we live in a fallen world. We are going to get affected by this. And you are going to go through bouts of, like I said, all those things which I mentioned. But you want perfect peace? Whose mind is stayed on? Come on, does he tell you a list of things to do? You want peace? Do this. No. He says you want peace which passes all understanding. And you go back to Philippians, read verse 7. Same thing. You will keep him in perfect peace. Whose mind, that your mind, stay on Jesus. In the morning, say thank you, Jesus. It's going to be a wonderful day because of you, Jesus. When you go to school, thank you, Jesus. No, you're with me today. I'm going to have a great time. Even if nobody talks to me, I'm going to have a great time. Oh, I'm beautiful. I'm wonderful. I'm highly favored. Yeah, you know, I'm going to be a great student. I'm not the smartest. Hey, God will give me his wisdom. I'm going to be smart. You lost somebody? Oh, thank you, Jesus. You're always with me. You never leave me nor forsake me. My loved one is in, the is in heaven. He didn't pass away. didn't just die. He's with Jesus. She's with Jesus. Oh, I've been abused. Yeah, but that was long gone. I have a new life now. You see, every problem ever that you ever went through with was dealt with by Christ at the cross, and even before that. The solution was always given before the problem came. Original blessing always comes before original sin. Never does God say, okay, you are created, now go and live in this sinful world and go fend for yourself. Go through the depression. Go through the abuse. Yeah, go take drugs. Never. 
we put ourselves there because we think it's something that we need to do when God actually already did it. Jesus did it. He did it. He really did it for you. You are perfect in Christ. No matter what you have been through, you are still perfect. That's why the Holy Spirit is in you. To remind you that every day. Remind you of what Jesus did for you. And every time in your dark nights, the thoughts coming back, the worries coming back, depression coming back, you think how bad you look, how bad you feel. The moment you sense that, don't go do something, don't go reach for the drug, say, Holy Spirit, you are in me because Christ paid the price for me. I'm perfect. And you go over that, your mind staying on Jesus and the peace will come down. Peace of God. And you go to sleep like a baby. And you wake up, feel like a teenager. Oh. You want this? Or do you want to take drugs? I've seen so many people taking drugs, painkillers. Oh, yeah, I feel bad. Two pills. But the two pills don't work now so much because your body gets used to it. Now you have to take what? Four pills, yes, four pills. And after some time, the four pills don't seem to work. What, how, what do you take now? Yes, you know. Because you feel you have to do something when you actually are already in that position because of Jesus in you. Everybody who does not know Jesus, you know, listens to this message through the internet, I implore you, come have a relationship with Jesus. Keep it real. Not morality, not religion, a relationship with Jesus whereby He bless you, He loves you unconditionally, and He accepts you, really, just as you are. That's how much He loves you. Have a relationship with Jesus.